This morning, we're going to be looking at lessons for a father. It's Father's Day, and we're so thankful that our dads, many of them, are here this morning. And uh, hopefully, in this message, you'll think about, okay, as a father, here's some things, three lessons I want you to think about from the passage that we're going to be dealing with. And then how we can apply that to our life and our families in a way that's going to create a positive situation for our families. And it's not only directed toward dads, but that is our focus this morning. But each and every one of us can learn from the principles that we see in the scripture that we're going to read this morning. We're looking at Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6 and beginning at verse 39, so, or, or 30, yeah, 39. So, if you will follow along with me in whatever translation you have, uh, I'll read. It says, And he also spoke a parable to them, A man cannot guide, a, a blind man cannot guide, a blind man can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you look at a speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice a log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out that speck that's in your eye, when you yourself... Do not see the log that is in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor on the other hand a bad tree that produces good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they pick grapes from the briar bush. The good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth what is evil. For this, for his mouth speaks from that which is in his heart. In this passage, I want us to look at the first two verses, then the second two verses, and then the last three verses. And I want to think about three lessons that we can learn from this passage and how we can put them into our life to make a difference in the way we're living. The first passage we look at is, is talking about we need to know what we're talking about. In other words, Jesus is looking here and saying, hey, there's a parable I want to share with you. There's the blind leading the blind. The religious rulers of the day were leading people down the false trail because they themselves were blind. They didn't know what the truth was. They didn't, they didn't focus on the truth. Yes, they had the Word of God. They had Scripture. They could read the Scripture. They could, they could understand uh, the words. They could even maybe break out the sentences and tell you every little detail of everything, but they didn't know the truth of the Scripture. And so one of the things we need to know is in our life, we need to know what we're talking about when we're trying to lead our family, when we're trying to lead our, our children, when we're, when we're trying to work with our wife, and we're trying to lead our family down the right path. We need to be scholars of God's Word. We need to hear from Him, but that first has to come in a relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you, you. In our world today, people are wanting hope. They're wanting freedom. They're wanting life. But without Jesus Christ, you cannot have any of that. One of the things we need to understand is that in our life, we need to make sure that we are allowing Jesus to be at the forefront of everything we are doing We can't be a good student or a good teacher in our family unless we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know what? Many of us are blinded simply by our own pride. We're good enough to do this ourselves. We're good enough to do it this way. 
But folks, we need Christ in our life because we can't do it alone. We need him. Some people will say, well, you know, Christianity is nothing more than a crutch that people kind of lean on and it just kind of helps wounded people get through life. Well, you know what? We are wounded people. So are you. We are all people who are fallen. We are all people who are shameful. We're all people who have failed. And every one of us need Jesus in our life. And so one of the things, if we're going to talk about what we know, we need to know the truth itself. John chapter 14 verse 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Now Jesus isn't saying, I am a way among many ways. I am a truth among many truths. I am one option for life among many options. Now, I know that in our culture, our culture tries to drive us to that. And sometimes we think that's very, uh, you know, Eastern in its approach. But every culture in the world has this idea of we can build religious systems or we can bridge our life through other ideas. But Jesus says there is no other way. A multiplicity of gods brings us to disaster. And I know it's not politically correct or, 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 or nice culturally to sit there and say, this is the only way. But it is. If you and I saw a young man and he had, there was a building on fire and he had just come out of that building and when he got out of that building he thought about, my favorite book's in there. And he started to run back into the building. What would you do? Would you just sit back and go, well, that's okay. He, he thinks the book is important and he needs to go back in there. He needs to get the book. Even though the building's totally consumed by fire, let him make up his own mind. That's okay. I don't really think you would be there. Because, see, in our mind, we differentiate that. And we say, well, but this is a physical fire. This is a real threat. This is a real danger. If he runs in there, he could die. So what we would do is we would tackle him on the way and stop him from entering the building and destroying his own life. But I want you to know spiritually, this is a very real picture. Without Jesus Christ, people are running into the burning building. And we need to be able to tell them the truth about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And every part of our life needs to be built off of the truth of Jesus Christ. And we need to be sharing Christ with those around us. We need to know what we're talking about. We need to know that when we look at it and we look at Scripture, that we're coming back to an understanding that there's no salvation anywhere else. There's no hope anywhere else. There's no life anywhere else. And so we need to focus on bringing people back to the truth that Scripture says. Now, as a father... You have the opportunity to lead your family spiritually toward truth in Jesus Christ. Take that opportunity. Study your Bible. Now let me tell you, you could come here 52 weeks a year. You could sit in this, this service and, and listen to a 30-minute message. And literally, I can tell you... now. This is from your pastor to you. If you listen to me for 30 minutes a Sunday every week of the year and you go home and you don't do any personal study yourself, you won't learn much of anything the whole time. Not at all. That's where you and I need to take the Word of God and we need to to look at it and we need to see how it fits with 
with the things in our life. And we need to understand that God's saying, hey, you want to know the way to life? Follow me. You want to know the truth about something? Look at my word. You want to understand what life is all about? Then follow what I have to share. That's going to be work on our part, but it will pay off in major dividends to our families. The blind cannot bleed the blind. Don't be blind. Study, learn, grow. Commit your walk to Christ and walk with Him. The second thing I want us to see is we need to take care of our own issues so, circle the word so, we can help others. Now, now, there's something in this passage when, when people look and many people will jump back up to verse 37. And if you jump back up to verse 37 in this passage, it says, Do not judge and you will not be judged. And do not condemn and you will not be condemned. And a lot of people will instantaneously look at this and say, You know, this passage of scripture tells me, as I'm, as I'm looking at it, that... I can't look at the speck in my brother's eye and judge them at all because I may have a log in my eye. And so earlier the scripture said, don't judge so I won't be judged. And, and so I'm not going to judge at all. You know what? The scripture does not teach for us not to be judging. It teaches us not to be judgmental. There is a huge difference between judging and judgmental. The Bible tells us to be fruit inspectors of fellow Christians. It tells us that when a fellow Christian is going the wrong direction, it is my responsibility and it's my opportunity to help bring them back into the right way. But here it cautions, don't be worried about a speck in somebody else's life if you've got a log in your own eye. In other words, it says you and I need to take care of the things in our own life first so that we can be helpful. And I can guarantee you, if you and I take care of those things in our own life first, when we move to that point of being helpful to somebody else, it's not going to come from an attitude of being judgmental. It's going to come from an attitude of caring and loving and, and building into that person's life the hope that we want to have. So when we're looking at our own issues, we need to ask God to help us clean up our own life. You know, one of my favorite uh, satire groups when I was in college was a group called Isaac Air Freight. You can actually still Google them and come up with some of their skits that they've done. But one of the skits that I liked that they did was based on this passage. It was Lex and Lena Logger. Now, back when I was in college, you didn't have videos of anything. It was just a record. So you put the record on and you had to imagine what was going on. But what's happening is the Lex and Lena Logger are sitting in their house and they're talking about everybody else. Did you see Miss So-and-so? Did you see what she did? I can't believe she did that. Yeah, you know, I'm, I can't believe that a person would do like that. And as they're talking, you're hearing dishes break. And you're hearing windows crash and all this because the log is hanging out of their eye and when they're whipping around to talk about somebody else, they're smashing everything in sight. They didn't see it themselves. And many of us are that same way. We're easy. That's our human nature. We're easily consumed with what somebody else does wrong, and we never put those standards on us. In fact, I had a teacher one time early in my grade school education that said usually when you see a problem in somebody else's life it's a mirror reflecting something in your own life wow when I begin to look at that and realize yeah it is so much of the time so what do I need to do as a Christian 
if I've given my life to Christ and I'm going to be a person that's going to remove the log from my own eye and help someone else with the speck in their eye, what do I do? Well, the psalmist says in Psalm 51, verse 7, Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. James would tell us that we're to draw near to God. We're to purify our hearts. We're to cleanse our hands. We're to do some things that we personally can do. So one of those things I can do is I can confess my sins before God. Now, you know, when we confess our sins before God, we, we, could, we need to get specific. We don't need to say a prayer that just says, God, forgive me of all my sins. Or God, forgive me of all my failures, because some of you don't think you have sins. Or, or God, forgive me of those things I did that may be shameful today. Uh, you know, that isn't, that isn't what type of prayer is going to make a significant difference in your life or mine. It's not recognizing the log that's in our own eye. God, I need to get specific with you today. I need to ask you to forgive me for the sin that is in my life. The guilt that is in my life. The shame that is in my life. I treated my wife in a way that you would not approve of today. Or I treated my children in a way that didn't build them up, but it tore them down. And you've called me to build into their life, not destroy them. God, help me with my pride. Help me to not put so much attention on me all the time. In your scripture, you've told me that I'm to think more highly of others than I think of myself. Forgive me of the fact that I went through this day and I only thought about me. Help me, Lord, because I went through this week and I only read your word one time. Help me, Lord, because I don't pray without ceasing like You've asked me to do, and you've told me, stay plugged in. As a matter of fact, think about it. If this camera weren't plugged, or this video player weren't plugged in, projector, you wouldn't see what's on the screen. I could sit there and plug it in, plug it in, unplug, plug, plug, plug. And, and all day long, we need to understand, we are doing that spiritually. Unplugging from the source of life. Another thing, Lord, forgive me of not taking opportunities to share hope in the darkness that we're in today. Help me, forgive me for not sharing Jesus. Get specific with God. You can do that. So you get in your prayer closet and you get with God and you say, God, clean me up. Ask God's help, because you can't do it yourself. I can't do it myself. And so we ask God to clean us so that his power will intervene. And then, when we've got the log taken care of in our eye, then we can graciously, compassionately, lovingly, care for the speck in someone else's eye. And I can remember times when I've gotten a piece of sand in my eye. It feels like somebody dropped a boulder in there, you know. And you'd go up to your mom or your dad and you'd say, I, I can't see. My, my, I got something in my eye. It's huge. And they'll very carefully get something to help get out that little grain of sand. And they'll say, there it is. You feel better? Yes, much, much better. Where is it? Oh, it's that little. You realize even the small specks cause a lot of pain and a lot of problems. And so it is important for us as believers to help others with specks in their eyes. But we need to be learners and we need to be those who confess. And we need to understand that Jesus is teaching us to be like him. When we look in the mirror of the Holy Spirit, we need to look like Christ. 
So he's not saying don't judge. He's saying don't be judgmental. But he is saying you take care of the issues in your life. And then in Galatians chapter 6 verse 1 he says, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So the Bible's telling me that we have the opportunity and the responsibility of helping other Christians walk closer to God. But we don't need to fall in that, that arrogant pride set that says, oh, I've got this whipped and taken care of. Because each and every one of us can fall in sin at any time. So focus on that. The third truth I want us to see is found in verses 43 through 45. And in those verses, it's talking about the good tree, the good fruit, and the good word. So it's looking and saying, hey, we need to realize that our life reveals what's in our heart. If your heart is rotten, you can fake it for a while. But eventually the truth is going to come out. And others are going to see what is in your life. Your words are going to reveal it. Your actions are going to reveal it. And so one of the things we need to think about is what are we doing? When, when our children see us, what do they see? Now, teenagers, pre-teenagers, they're probably, they're, they're at that age that they can see through fake quicker than anybody that I know of. As adults, we come to live with fake. We, we, we get comfortable with fake. And we play the game of, of life because that's kind of where we've, we've seen everything come. But there was, believe it or not, teenagers, there was a time when your parents were teenagers and they could see the fake too. That's amazing how many teenagers will look at a parent and they'll say, Mom, Dad, on Sunday, you're at church, you're in Sunday school, you're, you're in Bible study, you're doing something like that. But on Monday, where is God in our house? On Monday, how come your response is different than on Sunday? Your world collapses on Sunday and you say, God will take care of it. Your world collapses on Monday and you're like, why me, why me? You know, what happened to God would take care of it. Our kids actually see who we really are. And do you know that's why some of them give up this idea of even wanting to be a Christian? Because they think, based on what they're seeing, it's all fake. But it's not. It may be that you're faking it. But real, genuine faith in Jesus Christ is not fake at all. And so, I want you to think about what you are doing. Because it's speaking much louder than what you are saying. In fact, one of my friends told me, you know, I, I asked him what started him on his road to being an alcoholic. And he said, my dad. I said, well, how did that happen? He said he was sitting there with a can of beer in his hand saying, son, never drink. You know? Sometimes we do that same thing with all kinds of different things. And so we need to remember, God has said, hey, what we do needs to show our relationship with him. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, it says, 
Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So the truth that you know, the person of Jesus, needs to be lived out in a way that others around you see that truth coming to light. So that on Sunday, you're saying one thing, and on Monday, you're saying the same thing, and on Wednesday or Friday or Saturday, you're saying the same thing. Because a good tree bears good fruit. But what we say is also important. How we build up one another. How we encourage one another. How we strengthen our family. I, I'm amazed how many couples that I'll talk to uh, throughout my ministry where they'll say, you know, my, my husband and I, we get in an argument. Matter of fact, one of the things I do in premarital counseling is teach people how to fight fair. Now, Somebody would say, well, why would you do that? Because the reality as a couple, you're going to fight. Always. Adam and Eve had spats. Joseph and Mary had spats. Your mom and dad fought. And you will too. But I want you to know something. If you are ever in a fight where you're cutting someone down you are in the wrong place spiritually because in our world as a Christian even in the middle of a fight and you're going hold it pastor you know how hard that is? yes I know how hard that is do you know what don't tell anybody this but your pastor and his wife have had spats And sometimes we have to remember we're on the same team. And we want to respond to each other in Christian love the way God wants us to respond to each other. And so I don't need to cut her down. She doesn't need to cut me down. Same way in your life. Your children need to see you building one another, encouraging one another, even in the middle of those difficult times. In Ephesians, Paul tells us that no unwholesome words should proceed from our mouth. Only those words which are good for building up one another and giving grace. Wow. Matthew 15, 18 says, But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. Those are the ones that defile a man. In Job we read, My words are from the uprightness of my heart. Your words reveal where your heart is. So remember, first, have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Second, Deal with your own issues first so that you can help others. And third, your actions and your words need to be built off of your faith in Christ. Be a real Christian. It's easy to be a fake one. It really is. I want you to hear uh, at, at my dad's funeral, we shared a video of his own testimony. And I want to share that right now. Make sure the volume's up so we can hear this. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise 
Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Oh, oh, oh. Of course, I told you earlier that uh, my my greatest interest was race cars and such and I was kind of involved with NASCAR at that time on the weekends and such going to all the races for nothing you know just working with them and uh, so uh, Martha had, had made the statement that she wanted to get back in church well I've tried not paying attention to it and so, <clears throat> after a while there, of course, it got rather firm that she was going back and the kids was going to church. And I thought, well, I can play that part. And so I did. I, I played the part as a Christian. And I, I had the church so fooled that one night... We was at some, I guess, a business meeting or something, and it was brought up that uh, I was going to be a nominated as deacon. Strange thing, though. I just jumped up and I said, I think you need to be a Christian to be a deacon, and walked out of the church. And one of the, well, the, one of the deacons followed me out. And he stopped me in the out, on the outside there, and he asked me, he said, uh, did I hear you right, that you're not a Christian? I said, no, I'm not a Christian. And she said, well, said, I would have never dreamed it. I said, well, you can play for a good part, you know. <laughs> but uh, I said, undoubtedly God didn't want me to lie to him, and so I didn't, wasn't able to. Naturally, he sick the preacher on me, and uh, it was a it was a few months later that uh, I accepted Christ, and I was sitting in the pastor's car in front of the house where Butch had played like he was dead out there in the yard. <laughs> but I was 27 years old. And it's definitely been a change. And when before the throne I stand in Him complete Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still be You know, you can fake it all you want, but until you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, you will never know the truth, the power of everything that God has to offer you. So today, I want to say, dads, I know there are some dads probably here in this auditorium that are just like my dad. You're doing a good job faking your Christianity. But you're missing the greatest blessing of all. So I invite you this morning to just say to Jesus, Lord, I'm tired of doing it on my own. I want real life. And I'll say yes to you today and follow after you with all my heart. I was telling somebody between the services, my earliest childhood memory was his conversion. I don't really know anything before then much. 
But I know that when he accepted Jesus Christ, our entire family's life changed. And he wasn't faking it anymore. This morning, if you don't know Jesus, it doesn't matter if you're a father or a mother or a child. The invitation is open to you to say yes to Christ. Because God isn't wanting you to go through life <clears throat> living by a good set of rules that will help you look good. He's wanting to transform who you are to give you real life and real hope and real peace and real meaning. Would you say yes to Jesus? In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn. I'll be down front. And if you'd be willing just to step out from where you are and, and come up and just say, hey, I want to give my life to Christ, then we're here for you so that we can share with you how to do that. Today, would you follow him? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for your love for us. That even though we were worthy, wor worthlessness, guilt-ridden, and shameful, you desired to be with us forever. You went to the cross to be able to restore the broken relationship that we have, which was impossible for us to fix ourselves. Today, Lord, may we as fathers stand on your truth that you are the one true living God and there is no other. Lead us as fathers today to be your true disciples. Allow us to show our faith in you to our families each and every day. Grow us to be men after your own heart. That we may love you deeply and be filled with your love. And may that love pour out all over our lives and the lives of our families. Give us strength and wisdom, Lord, to face these difficult times. And allow us to love the unholy and the unlovely and those who persecute us. Allow us, Lord, to shine your light as a beacon of hope in the terrible darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.